Okay. So we thought uh, it was also important to give a look at uh, what is the status of uh, simulations. And therefore, we have uh, a lecture by Stefano Borgani, Borgani uh, about embody and hydrodynamical simulations. Okay. Um, see if this works. Okay. First technical problem. No, it was working before. Um, for some reason, it doesn't work anymore now. All right, I will start by. Uh, so there is a pointer right here. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, sorry for the glitch. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stefano Borgani. I'm here in Trieste, the Department of Physics of the University and the Astronomical Observatory. So my duty today will be to um, to entertain you with a with a discussion on end body and hydrodynamical simulations. Okay. I'm uh, not sure whether in uh, one hour and a half that we have, I will be able to go through the details and the technicalities that all this argument would deserve to be covered. Uh, but let's try to give at least some flavor of what a simulation is, and especially what a cosmological simulation is, which are the difficulties that people working in this field should face with. And especially I would like to make very clear the point about the limitations of these techniques, because too many times, too often simulations are taken as black boxes and the people, you know, maybe because the movies are not so beautiful and the pictures are so nice, uh, people tend to confuse uh, simulation results with the truth, okay? So let's see whether we can uh, somehow um, help understanding. Okay, it works again now. All right, so virtually my, my, my lecture should be split into three main parts. One is about end body methods. The second part is, so the discussion about how we treat a collisionless self-gravitating fluid with numerical methods, okay? The second part is about coupling the end-body method with hydrodynamical methods. So you can think about the end-body giving you the description of the evolution of the dark matter component of the universe and also including baryons as long as you make the approximations that baryons are still uh, collisionless. Then if we want to treat baryons as a collisional fluid, we go through hydrodynamics, and they will, I will discuss two alternative methods, which are, of course, Lagrangian and Eulerian, okay? And we will try to, make, to see the virtues and the limitations of these two methods. And then I will try at least to cover something about the applications to formation of cosmic structures, okay? So one thing is about including astrophysics of galaxy formation, and eventually, but I am afraid I won't have time to cover this, is cosmology with galaxy clusters and how you can use simulations to help uh, in this process. This is one of the several examples in which you can use simulations to calibrate cosmological tools and hopefully try to increase the precision of the cosmological tools that you use to, try to measure you know, fancy things like uh, uh, dark energy, modification of gravity, and things like that. Uh, what's to be said? One important thing is that when I will talk about including astrophysics of galaxy formation, we, you should keep in mind that usually these astrophysical processes that we are going to include in our simulations always happen, at least in cosmological simulations, well below the scales that are numerically resolved. Okay? These also need to be kept in mind because too often people say that simulations describe the evolution of, say, galaxies in a fully self-consistent way. This is actually not true. Okay? What we describe in a, in a uh, numerically converged fashion are microscopical scales. And then processes like uh, um, star formation, supernova explosions, AGN, uh, and things like that, they always happen in our simulations below the resolved scales, okay? So this should be kept in mind. Okay, let's get started with end-body simulations. A couple of papers here that you can use for reference, okay? This is actually a very nice review by Volker Springel. Um, it's a pretty extended review that you can, it's a very nice reading. All right, so what is an n-body uh, simulation? What is an n-body code? It basically, the, it, it is aimed to solve the problem of the dynamics of a self-gravitating collisionless system um, coupled with a Poisson equation, okay? So basically what you do in moving coordinates, so in a cosmological framework, you describe the time evolution of the phase-space density distribution, okay? Where x is the 
usual configuration on space coordinate, the conjugate momentum is p, and this evolves with time, okay? So basically this equation here aims to say that the total, deri the Lagrangian derivative of f with respect to time in some, with some suitably chosen time uh, coordinate is equal to zero. So this behaves like an incompressible fluid in its phase space uh, evolution. Once you couple this with the Poisson equation, then you recognize that this external potential phi is the gravitational potential, okay? And the density field is described as usual, as the integral over momenta of the phase space density distribution, okay? As simple as this. All right, now problem is, problem is, movies should start uh, somehow. Well, I have more than one technical problem today. All right, this movie should start, it doesn't. See, no, it doesn't, okay, we'll do it without movies. So the problem is that um, in this approach, this approach here is, is a problem in six plus one dimension, okay? Because it's in phase space. And the problem in such high dimensional space is difficult to solve numerically. It's very, you know, it's very computationally very demanding. In principle, we know how to do it, but it's a computationally very expensive. So the end body is such an approximation to this solution here. The, what the end body approximation does is, ma is basically to do a Monte Carlo, so a sampling of the initial, uh, of the initial phase space with n discrete fluid elements. So we take n particles to describe n fluid elements uh, that represent a coarse graining of the phase space di uh, distribution. And then what the, what the end body cost do does is to integrate the equations of motion in the collective gravity field. Okay, so basically this is equivalent to solve the characteristics equation, okay, to, so to, uh, to make, to see the evolution of your system along on the plane, on the hypersurface where this uh, function here is constant in time, okay? All right. <laughs> Come on. All right, sorry about that. So what this code does is to integrate the equations of motion. Therefore, if you have, uh, you can compute the acceleration, okay? You can compute the velocity of the particle and use these two equations to update the velocity and to update the position of the particle, okay? All right. So how to, how to do it, okay? The first n-body code that you can write is a simple do loop. It's, a nested, uh, it's two nested do loops, okay? As simple as this. You just, what you do is to compute for each particle the contribution to the force acting on that particle from all the other n minus one particle, okay? For the potential, you can take this expression here, okay? Where you recognize the Newtonian potential if epsilon goes to zero, but we need a value of epsilon different from zero for at least two reasons. The first reason is that we don't want to well, one is numerical stability. Basically, we, don't, we want to avoid that we have spurious scattering, a spurious collisionality between particles that are aimed to describe a collisionless fluid, first. Second thing is that if epsilon goes to zero, when the separation between a pair of particles goes to zero, then we have an infinite acceleration. And therefore, if we want to keep accuracy fixed in the integration of the orbits, we are forced to choose infinitely small time stepping with which to advance our system. And therefore, the computational cost diverges. But also this method here, even regularizing with this epsilon here, uh, which is usually chosen to be, say, between one-tenth and one-fifth of the mean interparticle separation, uh, we still need something like n-square operation, okay? So this method here, which is the first one introduced by Sven Arzat back in the 60s, is extremely expensive, okay? So there are two possible solutions for uh, increasing to make this feasible. The first one is to resort to special purpose hardware. So what you can do is to devise or construct or instruct uh, some, uh, some processor to be very stupid and be able to do just one operation, which is one over R squared or one over R if you're interested in the potential, okay? This is what the GPUs, the, you know, the standard GPUs that you guys use when you play with uh, some video, video game, okay? Um, this is one possibility. The other possibility is to resort to faster integration method that provides approximations to the exact computation provided by the n-square computation, okay? Uh, of course, this is always approximation. So, so whenever you have a faster method to integrate an n-body simulation, you must be always aware that you are introducing approximation. So better you keep control of the uh, uncertainties introduced by the approximation. So let's start with the first of such, such approximation, which is the particle mesh code. In the particle mesh code, what you do basically is to, you have the, the set of your n particles, 
and you compute the force on the grid points, okay, on a mesh, and then you use the force computed on this mesh to displace the particles, okay? So at the first sight, you may think that this is a quite, uh, quite a, a complex uh, procedure. It's actually, it turns out to be quite simple and especially extremely fast. So let's try to see which are the steps uh, to write a particle mesh code. The first thing, suppose that you start from a particle configuration. The first thing that you do is to compute, to assign the charge or the mass, if you want the density, on the mesh, okay? So you have particles with mass mi located at the positions xi, and you want to compute the density field at the position of the mesh xm. So basically what you do, you contribute, you sum the contribution of all particles, each weighted by some kernel function, which is an interpolation function, okay? This is the first step. Second step is to solve the Poisson equation in Fourier space, okay? So basically what you do is to write your potential in terms of the integral, the convolution, say, between your density field and the, and the Green's function of the Laplacian, okay? Um, so what you can conveniently do is to solve this in Fourier space, and therefore you just make the Fourier transform of rho, your density field, and of the green function, which is fixed. So you can compute it once at the beginning of your simulation, and that remains fixed forever. And then you compute the Fourier transform of your potential. And then you transform back to compute uh, the potential in the configuration space. This is the second step. Once you have done this, what you can do on the grid um, you compute the gradient of the potential, and therefore you compute the force. And this is a simple finite difference operation. You apply a finite difference operator to your potential. You compute the, the uh, components of the force on the grid, okay? This is the third step. Fourth step is to interpolate back the force that you compute on the grid points to the force at the particle positions. And what you do is simply to apply the same convolution method that we use for interpolating, assigning the charge on the mesh using exactly the same weighting function. Otherwise, you don't conserve momentum and energy, okay? So at this point, we have the force computed at the particle positions, okay? And we can, at this point, advance the particles, update velocities and positions. So the fifth step is to update particle positions and velocities. Basically, what you need to do is to use a scheme to integrate the simple, you know, second law of dynamics, acceleration equal force, okay? Um, this is apparently simple at this point. It's actually tricky. This is the mo one of the most delicate part of all the game because you need to be accurate on the way in which you update the things, okay? First of all, you need to choose a time step, okay? The time step should be small enough that you are accurate, that you make a small error in updating forces, uh, positions and velocities. At the same step, you, at the same time, you don't want to overdo, otherwise you are uh, burning CPU time without any reason, okay? So there are, there are many different criteria for advancing particles here. I'm using a scheme which is called leapfrogging, which you can either kick, drift, kick, or drift, kick, drift. What does it mean? It means that you can either choose uh, from the positions assigned at the position xn, which is the nth time step, okay, to compute the velocity at the nth plus one, so at half time step, advanced in time, okay, uh, computing the force at the position of the particle n and using the velocity at the time step n. Fair enough. Then what you do, you use this velocity to advance the position of the particle to the n plus one time step. At this point, you update the velocity at the same time to make particle position and velocities aligned in the time sequence, okay? So you understand why this is called leapfrog, okay? Because you make a jump at n plus one time step. The alternative is to do just the, you know, um, vice versa. So update first the particle position at half time step, then kick with the computation of the velocity, and then drift again, bringing the particle position at the n plus one time step, okay? All right, so the reason why all this is very fast is because when you go forth and back in Fourier space, you can do this with fast Fourier transform. And fast Fourier transform are computationally very efficiently, uh, efficient, they can, you can find parallelized versions, so on and so forth. So in this case, the computational cost doesn't go like n squared, but goes like the number of particle plus the number of grid points times the logarithm of the number of grid points, okay? Which is faster. Of course, the, there is a price to pay, yes. Uh, 
No, these are, um, these are, you know, there are different numerical schemes of interpolation. Basically, you, it depends on the trade-off between the cost of the interpolation operation and the accuracy of the interpolation operation. Uh, can be a linear interpolation, can be quadratic, so can be particle in cell, cloud in cell, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, this is not adaptive usually in n-body simulations because if you do it adaptive, then you have to modify also the Poisson equation. So in the start and n-body simulation, uh, it is fixed. Usually the interpolation is done on a few neighboring cells, okay? So for it, when you want to compute the density at, which, at one grid point, you just use the, uh, the particles in the, say, 27 surrounding cells, more or less. Okay, it depends a little bit on the accuracy of the scheme of interpolation. Okay, but it's not driven by any physical consideration except conservation of quantities and accuracy. All right. So, as I said, as I was about to say, um, the price to pay for this scheme here is that resolution now is bound to the grid size. Okay, you can't resolve things on a, grid, on a scale smaller than the grid size. Just a second. Um, of course, you can do adaptive mesh, but this is going to be too uh, complicated. There are a number of costs doing adaptive mesh in which you refine the grid locally according to the density. Yes? Huh. Right. Sure. Um, because, you know, well, if you, suppose that you want to compute the updated position, okay? And you compute the updated position from the old position plus velocity times time step. Which velocity? Is the velocity before or after the kick? Okay, so one, one first approximation is to use the velocity at half of the time step, just because you think you, you give a better approximation of what's going on in between. Okay, so this makes the integration more symplectic, if you want, so it's more time reversal, in a sense. Uh, yes, of course, but then you, you increase your computational cost. So there is always a trade-off between the accuracy that you want to reach and the computational cost. So if you use a finer, uh, a finer time stepping, of course you increase your computational cost and you are still not guaranteed if you don't use the half time step that your system is time reversible. Yeah? that you increase by a factor of two your, your uh, computational cost. So the game here is, the rule of the game is to, is to, reach the to reach a given level of accuracy by spending the least possible CPU time. Okay, so suppose that here I, I say that delta T is what I can afford with my computer. Okay, then how can I increase the accuracy? Where accuracy doesn't not only mean how accurate I'm integrating in the orbit, but also making considerations like time reversibility to make your, this system is Hamiltonian after all. Okay? All right. So another alternative is based on three codes in which you basically uh, couple the virtues of uh, a, an average uh, mean field approximations like the particle mesh uh, with the in direct integration. What you do in this uh, tree code, basically, is that if you have a group of particles which is far away from your target particle here, you can be tempted to use this group of particles as just one microparticle, okay? Whose position is the center of mass of this group of particles here, okay? And the distance is the distance from, the, um, from that uh, center of mass. Uh, of course, the accuracy here is related to the angle, or if you prefer, the size of this group here to be considered as a single particle, as a single macroparticle. You understand that if I put this group of particles closer to my target particle, then I will increase the, the error that I do in the computational defaults more and more, okay, if the size of this structure here is kept constant, okay? So basically what... Uh, this tree code does is to uh, fix a precision regulated by the value of the critical opening angle. So the opening angle is this one. So if the distance, if the size r 
AS is larger than the distance divided by the opening angle, the critical opening angle, then I should increase the accuracy. I cannot treat this group of particles just one uh, macroparticle. Okay? In this case, I have n log n operations, but the problem here is that there is a, a fairly large prefactor in front of n log n. Okay? And the second possible limitation is that in this case, what I need to do is to construct and store the structure of a fairly large hierarchical um, uh, binary tree. And I will make sure, uh, I will make it clear to you what I mean for this. Okay, so suppose that you start with a, with a particle distribution. The first thing that you need to do in this tree code is to make a, a recursive binary tree uh, reconstruction in which you divide your computational box in, in this case, in four parts. In three dimensions, it should be an OCT tree. Okay, so every time you split your computational domain in eight parts. And you keep going and going until you have in each of these small square either one or zero particle. Okay, so you end up with this. And the smaller squares in which you have just one particle, you call them the leaves of the tree. Then you have the branches of the tree, like this one, this one, this one. And this is the main, uh, the main branch okay, of the tree. Okay? All right. So once you have done this recursive uh, operation, what you do for each particle, for each target particle, you decide whether a group of particles can be treated only as just one, so you are happy to stop with a, with a branch of the tree, or you need to go and over and over and opening the tree down to the leaves, okay? This is what you need to decide. So suppose that you, okay, we'll make it clear with an example. Um, so again, if the critical, if the opening angle is smaller than the distance over the size of the group, then I need to open the node and therefore going down, walk the tree down to smaller branches. Otherwise, I, I stop and I consider the group of particles just one single macroparticle. All right, so suppose that you have a particle distribution like that. This is the binary tree that you would, the hierarchical tree that you would construct in this case, okay? And suppose that now I want to compute the structure of the tree that I need to open for the particle located at the origin of coordinates, like here. And you see that distant portions of, the, of, the, um, of these computational volumes are treated as stopping at the branches of the tree, while as I go closer and closer, I need to open the tree and walk the tree down to the leaves, and therefore taking the smallest uh, cells. Okay? So this is the, this is the uh, philosophy of this method extremely fast and accurate. You need a lot of memory to store the structure of the, of the tree. All right, there are hybrids. There are hybrids in which you try to combine the virtues of the different codes. So one of the hybrids is the 3PM. So you use the tree code to compute the short range force and the particle mesh part, uh, to compute the long range force, okay? So in principle, the philosophy is that you split your potential, compute in Fourier space into a long range potential and a short range potential. One thing that you have to be careful in doing this game, okay, is that it may happen that one particle that is close to you, to the target particle, okay, gives a contribution that is counted twice. It's counted once when you assign the charge on the mesh for the PM part, and it's counted twice, the second time, when you compute the direct force on, uh, through, the, uh, through the tree code. Then you have to be careful, therefore, not to double counting the contribution of these particles. And this is usually done by filtering your potential, cutting usually with a sort of Gaussian, like here. Okay? So this is the long range force, and you integrate the PM using this force here instead of the standard one over R. And this is instead the potential that you use for the short range force. And the combining the two, of course, you get a well, very well matched one over R uh, potential with the long range, which is this one, that you compute with a particle mesh, and the short range, which is this one, computed with a tree code, okay? So this is good because you, be, you can be very accurate on the computation of the short range force, and you are not bounded anymore to the lowest resolution set by the mesh size in the PM part, okay? All right, and then there is a number of hybrids like the P3M in which you do particle-particle instead of tree codes, you direct integration for nearby particles and then PM again. So this is particle-sorry. Pa this is particle-particle, particle-mesh. So that's why P3M. Or you can do even something even more complicated like adaptive P3M, so in which you have the P3M with a PM part which is adaptive. Okay, so with a grid that is locally adaptive or the adaptive 3PM part. 
Okay? So there are a number of varieties. You can increase the complexity of your code and try to take advantage of the different techniques depending on the regime in which you are working. All right. So this is, in, well, in these days, I should say that the codes that are most used are adaptive 3 p.m. Okay? This is the, the philosophy of the codes that are mostly used. Okay? Or there are also completely adaptive PM codes, which are also used by a community, especially of people working with the Eulerian uh, hydrodynamics. Okay, so this is the record today. It's a one trillion particle simulation done by Skillman et al. from the dark sky simulation set. Um, and this is just to give you a flavor of what you can do in these days, okay? So this is a picture showing the past light cone, the density on the past light cone between ratio 0.9 and 1 for a concordance lambda CDM model. Okay, so this is the size of the computational effort that you can do in these days with these n-body codes. All right, let's move to hydrodynamical methods. Okay, a couple of references here. This is Monaghan, which is a standard reference for, Eulerian, for Lagrangian um, hydrodynamics. Rosbock, which is also for Lagrangian hydrodynamics. This is a review that I wrote with Klaus Dolak, where we give both Lagrangian and Eulerian, and eventually something about n-body simulations. And this is also the same nice review that I mentioned to you before, where this, there is a very nice explanation of both Lagrangian and the Eulerian methods, and also hybrid methods. All right, so what is numerical hydrodynamics? Very simply, it is meant to follow the formation and evolution of baryonic structures, okay, inside the potential wells of the evolving dark matter density field. There are two classes, Lagrangian and Eulerian, and the Eulerian, as you well know, uh, the Eulerian methods are based on uh, computing quantities at fixed locations in space and uh, computing the fluxes of gas and energies between uh, neighboring cells. The Lagrangian methods instead you follow along their orbits the fluid elements and you update the thermodynamical quantities as the fluid element moves along the orbit. Okay, so the standard definition of Lagrangian and Eulerian uh, hydrodynamics. All right, well, so what we do? Uh, so in hydrodynamics, we have state functions, which are basically the density, the three components of the velocity field, pressure, and internal energy of my fluid element. And what I do is to integrate this set of equations here. So continuity equation, uh, the Euler equation, which I have the, you know, uh, this is basically the acceleration, the total acceleration given by pressure force plus gravitational force. And then I have the energy conservation equation, which is basically the first law of thermodynamics in which I set dq equal to zero. And this system of equation here is closed once I assign this, the equation of state, okay, which is the relation between density, pressure, and internal energy. And in all this notation here, total derivative, which is the Lagrangian derivative, is usually, as usual, given by the partial time derivative plus the uh, advection term. Okay, this is the notation. Standard fluidodynamics, nothing fancy. So at the heart of Lagrange, of Eulerian methods is the solution of the so-called Riemann problem. I won't talk about Riemann solver because it would itself take, um, you know, probably two or more lectures. So what is the Riemann problem? The Riemann problem is basically an initial value problem for an hyperbolic system in which you have the state variables given by u and the fluxes given by f. Um, so it's a sort of continuity equation for a given generic quantity u and a given flux f. And this is an initial value problem for two piecewise constant states with an interface at t equals zero. Okay, so basically you have a piecewise constant phase here, piecewise constant phase here, and the problem is to compute the fluxes and the evolution of my state variable u given by the computation of the flux across this interface. Okay, so the state variables are usually specified on the left part, and on the right part. And this is an example. This is an example of a Riemann problem, okay, in which you have constant pressure, density, and velocity set equal to zero, both to the left and to the right part. In this case, we have the so-called salt shock tube. Okay, it's a simple, it's one of the uh, simplest cases in which you have, in fact, an analytic solution, okay? Um, and this is the time evolution of this uh, uh, shock problem in which you have basically, as you allow the, your system to evolve, you have the propagation of a shock, which is here. You have a creation of a contact discontinuity here across which the pressure is, is, is constant. And you have a rarefaction fan, a rarefaction wave, uh, which bears in mind the, the, the fact that this shock is propagating. This discontinuity here is propagating, okay? So in general, 
whenever you have a, an Eulerian code, what the Eulerian code is meant to do is to have two fluid elements that you can decide to locate in your, at your best convenience and solve the Riemann problem. So find a, an exact or iterative solution um, for this problem of computing fluxes F across the interface. All right. So this is what you do. Again, this is your uh, hyperbolic system with a state variable u, fluxes f, equation of state. You specify your variables inside your cells, and you define the average state within a cell, which is just the volume of your quantity that can be uh, density, velocity, or total energy of your system, of your fluid element. And this is the average value within the cell. OK, so what you need to do is to compute this quantity here. Okay, so the integral between x minus i minus one half, so between the boundaries of the cell and across a time step of the f in the t, the u in the t plus the f in the x. Okay, so this is of course the one dimensional case, equal to zero. This gives you the conservation law, and this is what you need to do to solve your system. So again, here we have our state variable specified within these cells, and we need to compute the fluxes across the boundaries. All right, so if we start from this and we make the uh, time discretization for the evolution of u and the uh, x discretization for the uh, gradient of, uh, for the divergence of f, what we end up with is this expression here, okay? In which we have this the integration within the boundaries of your cell of your quantity u at two different time steps and plus the integral across the time step of the value of the fluxes computed at the interfaces, okay? So this is basically co uh, the continuity equation. You have that the variation of u is given by the flux f uh, across the surface, across the boundaries of your fluid element, okay? So again, if you define this uh, cell average quantity, this quantity, this equation here can be recast in this form here. And basically, at this point, what is the rule of the game? It's computing this quantity, f, the fluxes, across the boundaries at i plus one half and i minus one half, and use this to update un to un plus one. So you advance by one time step your, uh, your state variables. The so-called Godunov scheme uh, is a scheme in which you basically say that you assume, you make the answers, that the quantity here, the fluxes, are computed as solution of the Riemann problem, Okay, in which the state variables are computed at the end time step at, the, at two or more cell positions. So you solve your Riemann problem, you have the flux across the boundaries, you include the flux across the boundaries in this equation here, and you update your uh, state variables. Okay, as simple as this. Okay, as simple as this, apparently. There are a number of, huge number of complications here, but, you know, related to the, especially to the Riemann solver. Okay, but in principle, this is the general philosophy. One delicate point, okay, so the general philosophy can be uh, summarized in this slide here. So basically, your evolution is done in three steps. Reconstruct, evolve, average. REA uh, -E uh, scheme, or ROI scheme, as uh, is commonly said. So in the, the first phase is the reconstruction. So in the reconstruction, you start from the cell average state, so UN, okay, within each of these cells, and you compute the run of this quantity within the cell. And the, uh, the aim of this is to compute the quantities at the interface of the cells so that you specify the left and right part of the state variables that you should use to solve your Riemann problem. Then you evolve, meaning that you solve the Riemann problem and you compute the fluxes. Once you, once you have computed the fluxes, you average. So what does it mean is that you compute again you compute again the cell average quantity, okay, within each cell, once you account for the entering and with the incoming and the outgoing fluxes, okay, that you compute with the evolved part, uh, and that's it. And then you iterate and you cycle, okay? So these are just two examples in which you, that you can uh, uh, see to reconstruct, to reconstruct the, um, the state variables within your cell. In first approximation, you can simply assume that they are constant. So within the cell, it's simply constant. If you want to be more accurate, you try to do a linear interpolation between a given number of neighboring cells, okay? There are further complications here, because like in this example here, for instance, if you do this linear interpolation, you may end up with situations in which 
okay, the state variable here after the interpolation is more extreme than the values that you have in your system. And this creates unpleasant features like unphysical oscillations of the solutions and things like that. And what the people usually does with some black magic, I would say, um, is impose some slope limiters in such a way that the slope of the assignment for the assignment of the left and right state inside this cell cannot be arbitrary. It should be limited in such a way that you never exceed the extrema. All right. Um, again, there is a whole industry of methods for doing the reconstruction, and these methods are meant to be stable, non-oscillatory, to preserve monotonicity, use more grid points to increase the accuracy in the reconstruction, and so on and so forth. Okay? There is a huge literature of this business uh, which is really a problem. This is the core of the problem of Eulerian methods. To be sure that you have under control diffusivity of your Riemann problem and un unpleasant numerical effects related to the reconstruction. Um, all right, so um, how much time? Oh, okay. So um, there are different kinds of Eulerian codes. Eulerian codes, in principle, have the same problem of the PM of the particle mesh code because you are bound to the size of your grid on which you are solving your uh, Riemann problem, in principle. In practice, there are a number of tricks of numerical, well, more than tricks are numerical techniques, okay, in which you can increase the resolution, for instance, with adaptive mesh refinement, okay, in which you refine the mesh according to something. Can be density, but density may not be the only criterion with which you want to refine. For instance, if you are interested in resolving accurate shocks, then what you want to do is to refine whenever you have an in, a jump in pressure or a jump in entropy, okay? So you can use different state quantities to define the criterion for uh, the refinement. Or you can have moving mesh, like in the uh, Arepo code, which is one of the codes uh, which use a, a moving mesh. So the mesh is not fixed, it doesn't have a, a fixed geometry, and the mesh itself can move with the flow, can be sort of Lagrangianly advected along with the fluid, okay? And this is very nice because this allows you to, um, how to say, to couple the, the, you know, to couple the good features of a Eulerian scheme with the good features of a Lagrangian scheme, okay? And these are nice features in which you see, this is in the case in which you, in which you have a mesh which is given by the Voronoi tessellation of your particle distribution. You make a Voronoi tessellation. In this case, you need to solve the Riemann problem across all the surfaces of this, bound, of this Vor uh, Voronoi polyedra. It's more complicated, but you can do that. And there are also meshless uh, codes in which you like the Godunov SPH, which is my favorite. And the only problem is that I never make it working, but I mean, I, I still, I'm still trying. Okay, it, it, which is very nice because basically it's a la, co completely Lagrangian coding which you solve the Riemann problem between each pair of particles. Okay, if you're interested, I can tell you more. All right, so this is about Eulerian schemes. Let's go to the smoothed particle hydrodynamics. Smoothed particle hydrodynamics is one of the incarnation of possible Lagrangian schemes, okay? So in Lagrangian schemes, basically what you do, you, you sample your fluid with points, with particles, and again, hydrodynamic quantities are carried by each fluid element and you follow along the trajectory. And the particles move under the Euler equations, of course. Um, and they use smoothed quantities. What I will show you what I uh, mean. And these quantities are re-evaluated at each time step. Okay? So let's see what it means in practice. So we have a generic field F, which is a continuous function in your uh, in your domain, okay? And the, and the thing is that you want to compute the interpolated quantities at a given position R, knowing its distribution at some sampling points R prime, with an accuracy, with a resolution which is given by this interpolating kernel W, which has a resolution given by H. So basically, this is a sort of filter, okay? It's the interpolating function that you use to assign the value of a continuous function from, which is sampled at discrete points in space. Okay? So this is an interpolating kernel, and H gives you the smoothing length, so the coarse graining scale for your hydrodynamics. Okay, so this kernel needs to have some good features. The first feature is that when you take the limit for H going to zero, what you need, want to have, you want to recover the original function. So when you go to, for, in the limit for H going to zero, you better this goes like a Dirac delta function. The other thing that you want to have from your kernel is that it concerns it concern mass. 
Therefore, the total integral over the whole volume should be unity. All right. So then we discretize. So we said that the idea is that we want to sample our fields with points, with particles. Okay. So we have what? Uh, the first thing, we take this interpolating function here, multiply and divide by rho, by the density. Okay. And then we say, okay, I, I'm not doing an integral. I'm simply sampling my fluid, con my continuous fluid with particles, which are labeled by this B label here. All right, so in this case, what I say is that the value of the field interpolated at the position R is simply given by my kernel function multiplied by the value of the field F computed at the position of the particle B weighted by the inverse of the, vo by the volume, by D3R, which is mass divided by density. Fair enough, if for R, if for F I take the density, this is my density estimator, okay? So interpolation of the values of the mass carried by each particle using the interpolating kernel. It's quite simple. All right. So which kernel? kernel? This kernel should have few properties. The first property is that should conserve angular momentum. Therefore, first approximation is better if you use a, a fully radial kernel. Uh, for computational reasons, you prefer to have a compact support. Why a compact support? If the support is not compact, it means that for each particle, you need to sum over all the particles of your system. Okay. However, hydrodynamics, we know that uh, hydrodynamics, unlike uh, gravity, is a short-range interaction. And therefore, you may be happy enough to take just a compact kernel, a kernel with a compact support. Okay. You don't want to uh, go and weigh particles which are fi far away from my target particle. So usually one popular uh, kernel expression is this one, is the so-called B-spline cubic kernel, in which you have that the, uh, first of all, is compact. You have a vanishing value of the kernel whenever uh, the, the separation is two times uh, the kernel uh, coarse graining scale. And these are first and second order derivatives that are continuous. So it is a well-behaved kernel that you can use for this business. Again, if you go in the literature, you find a plethora of these kernel functions of different orders, and you can make your optimal choice depending on the trade-off, again, between the computational cost and the accuracy that you want to reach. Okay? So the Gaussian kernel is very useful for analytic computation, but again, the Gaussian kernel has a non-compact support. So in principle, it's much more costly than any compact kernel. All right, so this is the interpolating function. Now, a few tricks. First trick, differentiation. So if I have to compute the gradient of this function f, very trivially, this can be computed in this way. So sum over the particles, mass over density, times the value of the function at the position of the b particle, times the gradient of my kernel. Unfortunately, this doesn't go to zero even if f is equal to, is constant, okay? So what you need to do is to use a simple trick in which your function f here is labeled by a. You multiply by a function, an external function phi, okay? And what you do in this case is that dA in dx is 1 over phi computed at the position of the, or the, of the target particle A sum over B of mB, phi B over rho B, which is this, one, this uh, first piece here, minus this second piece here, which is given by this quantity, this second term, okay? And this goes manifestly to zero if A is constant this time, okay? It's a trick, but you have to play these tricks in a, uh, with this kind of um, codes. All right, so if phi equal to one, you have this a scheme for computing the gradient. If phi equal rho, you have the density weighted gradient and you have this other expression. And very simply, at this point, you can compute the continuity equation. So d rho in dt, which is equal to minus uh, rho divergence of the velocity field, in the SPH jargon is computed with this expression here, where VAB is the difference in velocity between particle A and particle B. So this is the first equation of hydrodynamics that we can translate in SPH jargon. Second is the Euler equation, so the momentum equation. The momentum equation, you have dv in dt minus gradient of pressure over rho, okay? Again, even in this case, if you do a brute force differentiation of this, this is the expression. However, if you compute the force acting on the particle A exerted by the particle B, Using this simple expression here, this is what you would get. If vice versa, you compute the force acting on the particle uh, B exerted by the particle A, 
you get this expression here. Now, if pressure is not constant, therefore PA is different from PB, you have that you violate, um, you don't conserve momentum, you violate the first law of dynamics, okay, which you don't like, okay? So you have to do something for this, uh, and again, it's a trick, and what you do in this case, you compute the gradient of P over rho by writing this as the gradient of P over rho plus P gradient of rho over rho squared, okay? You do the SPH translation of this, and you end up with an expression for the momentum equation, which is completely symmetric for A and B, and therefore you conserve momentum, okay? Looks like we are, pl uh, we are playing uh, dirty, dirty tricks here. It's actually what happens, okay? So this is accurate and conserved momentum, which is what you want to, what you want to have. All right, so we have continuity. We have the momentum equation. What we need to integrate is the energy equation. This is the energy equation. So variation of the internal energy, uh, and this is the flux, the corresponding flux. Again, also in this case, you can play with uh, some algebra here, and what you end up with is the expression for the Lagrangian derivative for the, uh, for the variation of the internal energy of the particle A, which is given by this expression here, where VAB is again the different, uh, velocity difference between particle A and B, okay? And that's, you can figure out that this is the result of simple computations, okay? All right, then you have the equation of state, and that's it. Okay, so you have three momentum equation, one continuity equation, one energy equation, and one equation of state. Five equations for, uh, for five unknown quantities. Okay, and we can integrate. All right, you can do something more refined like integrating uh, directly the entropy and therefore enforcing the conservation of the entropy at the particle level, okay? In case you don't have any variation of entropy associated to uh, dissipation uh, of energy. You can do, and this is more important, enforce the local, uh, to make locally adaptive code in which the choice of the softening is dictated by the local value of the density. And this is what you want to do if you want to take full advantage of the Lagrangian nature of the code. Because you, what you want to do is to have better resolution whenever the density is higher. So whenever rho i is higher, I take a smaller smaller uh, interpolating, a smaller size for the interpolating kernel. And if you do that, uh, you, can, you can figure out that if you run your Lagrangian derivation of the fluid equation and so on and so forth, you put the Lagrangian constraints imposed by this condition here, you end up with the equations which are completely analogous to what we saw before, except that everything must be multiplied by this correction factor Fi that accounts for the density dependence of the kernel. Okay, to make your code fully adaptive. Okay, does it work? No, it doesn't. Um, so this is the solution of the uh, sod shock tube that I showed you before, okay? So this is the solution of the simplest Riemann problem, okay? For which we have an analytic solution. So as I said, rarefaction wave, discontinuity, and shock. Um, this is the run of the density, this is the run of the pressure, this is the run of the velocity. And this is the, the solution, the SPH solution, with the equation that I showed you before. And as you can see, there is a huge noise here. First of all, you notice two things. If you look carefully, the position of the shock is not correctly recovered. It's actually a little bit anticipated, and there is a huge noise in velocity. Basically, what happens is that you have a pileup of momentum on small scales, and therefore you have a lot of noise in the particle velocities, and this happens because this poor SPH particle, in the absence of any dissipation term, the only equation is not dissipative, okay? In the absence of any dissipation term, they, they just pile up. They, they keep accumulating uh, kinetic energy, and they don't know what to do with this kinetic energy, okay? So it doesn't work. So what to do to make it working? What we need to do is basically to convert this mechanical energy here that is spuriously accumulated into thermal energy, okay? So we want to capture the shock better. To do this, what the people usually do is to modify the Euler equation. So we modify by hand the correct equations by introducing an artificial viscosity contribution to the pressure. And this artificial viscosity in general, this expression here, with a term of bulk viscosity and uh, another quadratic viscosity, which is called von neumann rickmeyer viscosity, that the people work it out actually studying the, you know, the first experiments of atomic bombs. They try to, um, to understand which is the viscosity in the, during the fallout, okay? So this is the reason for this von Neumann-Rittmeyer viscosity. 
So which is the rational? The rational is that basically the relevant quantity is the, is the jump in velocity between two fluid elements, which is this quantity here, L times, L is the separation between two fluid elements times the divergence of the velocity field. This is the sound speed of your medium, okay? So you have this linear and this quadratic contribution in velocity jump. All right, so this means that if I have a viscosity term, so if I use an Euler equation with a viscous term in which I add to the, to the pressure this quantity here, um, in, the, in the SPA jargon is like adding to the momentum equation, okay, this pi AB, where pi AB is again a viscosity term which, which contains a term of bulk and a term of second order. This linear part here is this, this second order part here is this one, and this mu AB basically is given by, is again the velocity jump, as that we said before. And one thing that you want to have in your system is that you want to turn on your viscosity only when you have a convergent flow, because it's the case in which you have shocks. If you have a divergent flow, you don't care. You don't want to introduce viscosity where you don't need it. So whenever you have a convergent flow, and therefore a divergence of the velocity field minus a negative, then you turn on this viscosity. And then you have this numerical factors here, alpha, beta, epsilon, here to regularize this velocity jump. And there is nothing you can do rather than, except than fixing this number by running control experiments. So there is no first, uh, first um, principle telling you which is the value of these quantities is again running control experiments and trying to reproduce as accurately as possible the analytic solutions. Um, of course you can, okay, so this is, once you add this, uh, this value of the pressure, then this is the modified value, the modified expression for the momentum equation, the modified expression for the uh, energy conservation equation. Further, complication just to make you aware of the things that you have to be careful of. Suppose that you have a shear flow, okay? If you have a shear flow, of course you don't have shocks, and therefore you don't want to turn on viscosity, okay? However, if you use the viscosity expression that we wrote before, okay, with this mu AB, okay, so this expression here, with this mu AB, okay, in a shear flow, what we have is that the scalar product between the separation vector and the difference of velocities is different from zero. They are not orthogonal. And therefore, you would have a spurious appearance of viscosity in a shear flow, which is not what you want to have, okay? So there is, again, a switch in this case in which you compute a quantity Fa and you multiply your viscosity pressure by this quantity Fa, which has these two terms here. There is a divergence of the velocity field and the rotational component of the velocity field. So whenever you have a shear flow, this is equal to zero, okay, physically, and therefore this goes to zero. If you have a purely compressional flow instead, this is the quantity that goes to zero and you recover the previous expression for the viscosity, okay? So this is to prevent the appearance of spurious viscosity in cases that you, where you want to have no viscosity. So suppose that you have a rotating disc which are with a shear rotating disc, and you don't use this Balsar switch, what you would have is a spurious transfer of momentum just due to the presence of viscosity, okay? All right. And then you can do fancy things like, you know, uh, since you are not happy with having this artificial viscosity, you, you would like to get rid of this artificial viscosity uh, away from shocks, and therefore you write down a dynamical equation for the viscosity coefficient, which you have a source term, which is again given by the minus the divergence of the velocity field, and a decay time at which this velocity, viscosity goes to zero when you are away from the shock, okay? So these are all sort of tricks that you can resort to to optimize the performances of your code. You run the sod shock tube, and in this case, you get a much, much better agreement. First of all, you notice that there is, the velocity noise is much reduced, and you capture the shock perfectly here, okay? But the problem is that, look at this. Um, Ear pressure should be constant across the discontinuity. Instead, when you have the discontinuity um, in density and therefore in energy, you have a blip in pressure, okay? And this blip in pressure that is, okay, you can say, okay, who cares? It's a small feature in this solution. It's actually causing most of the drawbacks of the SPH. 
So this blipping pressure is actually uh, caused by a spurious pressure force that arises at the discontinuity, and this spurious pressure force causes a sort of surface tension. Once you have this surface tension, basically what happens is that you don't mix these two parts of the discontinuity, okay? So whenever you have some hydrodynamical instability developing, this ten surface tension force, it prevents the development of hydrodynamical instabilities, okay? And the reason for this is, again, that there is no diffusion of energy across the discontinuity because we are preserving entropy at the particle level. This is what we impose to the code, and the code very nicely implements this. Problem is that it's a, an unwanted feature, an unpleasant feature. It's wanted but unpleasant. Okay. This time should start. Otherwise, uh, otherwise... Ay, ay, ay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Why? I don't understand why this guy doesn't start. Huh. Let's put it this way. Let's put by hand. So one of the features No, doesn't even start in this way, right? All right, so what this movie was meant to show <laughs> is that, <laughs> all right, um, what this movie was meant to show is the development of the Calmir and Helmholtz instabilities. Oh, it doesn't start for whatever reason. So Calvin and Helmholtz instabilities what? Are the hydrodynamical instabilities, fluidodynamical instabilities are the interface between two fluids moving, moving with respect to each other in a shear flow, okay? So if you add a velocity perturbation along the y-axis, okay, so with a sinusoid, you have a de development of these curls, okay, over a time scale which, is, which can be computed in terms of the local density, velocity difference, and the uh, wavelength of the velocity perturbation. Okay, so this is what? The comparison between an Eulerian code where you correctly develop these instabilities and an SPH code in which you prevent the development of these instabilities. I, I'm very sorry because the movie is really instructive. Anyway, so the movie would show that you don't develop these instabilities, okay? Sorry about that. I can show you later on offline if anyone is interested. All right. So, but we know that this happens, okay? We know in nature that this uh, uh, Calvin Helmholtz instability happens in the real world. So we know that there is a problem, which is the cure of this problem. Um, the cure of this problem is basically to allow for the diffusion of energy across the contact discontinuity, okay? Which, is, which we identified as the problem causing the blip in the short shot tube. So to allow this is, again, we had to include a switch. The SPH is full of switches, okay? So you, every problem that you have in SPH, you cure with a switch. The good thing is that there is a switch, okay? Meaning that since it is a switch that you introduce by hand, you can move the switch to your, you know, according to your, what you want to reach. In the Eulerian codes, there is not such a switch, okay? So you would say, oh, nice, I don't need tricks. Problem is that in, in the Eulerian codes, um, you have diffusivity of your solution of the Riemann problem, which is something that you cannot control, okay? So you can control by changing the Riemann solver, by changing uh, the reconstruction method, by changing the slope limiter, and so on and so forth, but it's not something that you put by hand and you can regulate time by time, okay? So there are pros and cons, okay, in this, in this, um, in this business. So in the SPH, what you can decide to do is to introduce a dissipation term for a conserved scalar quantity, okay? So given a scalar quantity, you can always write a sort of continuity equation in which the variation of your scalar quantity is given by the flux of the scalar quantity, okay? So you have the scalar quantity A at the position A and B, 
you have your kernel, um, and then you have that, for instance, you put a coefficient alpha that tells you how much diffusion you want to have, and this signal velocity here, which is basically the sound speed, okay? So depending on the sound speed, you want to diffuse quantities according to some sound speed with a degree of diffusivity which is set by a dimensionless parameter here, okay? And you do that. All right, if you do this to diffuse momentum, okay, you recognize that this equation here is nothing but the viscosity, the artificial viscosity that we introduced before. So artificial viscosity is nothing but a way to diffuse momentum, which is what we want to do, because we said that in SPH, when we approach a shock, there is a pileup of momentum accumulation in particles that we want to get rid of. And the way we get rid of it is introduce artificial viscosity. If I do the same for internal energy, then what I do, okay, so this is artificial viscosity that we saw before. If I do the same for the, for the internal energy, what I, do, what I have is the thermal energy diffusion. It's not Spitzer like thermal conduction, okay? It's not thermal conduction. Thermal conduction is related to the mean free path of electrons in a unmagnetized plasma, okay? This is something that I introduced by hand, okay? I introduced by hand to get rid of the pileup of energy on small scales. You can think of the SPH like producing a turbulent cascade in which you transfer energy from the large eddies to the small eddies. And once you reach the small eddies, the, the energy remains there. It, the code is not diffusive at all, and you don't know what to do with this energy, okay? So that's why you create this pile up and the surface tension, okay? And this is a way of getting rid of this uh, piling up of energy on the small scales. Okay, and then there are tricks in which you define which is the signal velocity for the artificial viscosity, which is the signal velocity for the internal energy, in which you uh, regulate this by the difference in pressure, and so on and so forth, okay? And again, you run the, uh, the same test as before, and what you get this time is the, this red curve. So this red curve here is the behavior of the pressure across the, this continuity here. So the solution of the standard SPH is this blue, the green on the bottom is the PPM, so it's the Eulerian solution, and the red is the solution using artificial diffusion of the thermal energy. So you get what you want to do, okay? You get what you wanted to obtain in a sense, okay? So this is good. All right, again, I can show you the movie, but, uh, but if you make a comparison between the standard SPH and the new SPH in which you introduce this scheme here, in this case, you have the correct development of the curve features of the ice cut, uh, cut ice, as people say in jargon, uh, produced, by, produced by the uh, kelvin helmholtz instabilities, okay? So you exactly reproduce what you get in the Eulerian codes, Exactly, okay? So basically you, you recover what you hope to recover uh, once you include this uh, artificial uh, diffusion. All right, to sum up. Eulerian versus Lagrangian. So which are the advantages of the Lagrangian scheme is that you have better resolution where needed in high density region, and this is normal because in any Lagrangian scheme, whenever you have more density, you have more particles, and therefore it's intrinsically adaptive can be easily coupled to n-body codes because it's a particle-based method, and it's intrinsically Galilean invariant, okay? Actually, Galilean invariance is broken in Eulerian codes because of errors that you make in the advection of the fluid elements, okay? So it's not explicitly, it's not explicitly included in the code. It's something that you have to correct for. The SPH disadvantages is that it is always a low order accuracy for the treatment of contact discontinuities because we have this smooth kernel. So whenever we have a sharp discontinuity, either in density or in energy or in entropy or in whatever, uh, the best you can do is to recover the discontinuity with a kernel. And the kernel is smooth, and therefore you have a smooth representation of a sharp discontinuity. Uh, there is a lot of subsonic velocity noise that we can try to cure, with, again, with switches. Um, the, there is a poor shock resolution for the same very reason of this first point here, and there is a difficulty in following hydro instabilities. Oh, each of these problems can be cured, but again with switches that we need to introduce ad hoc in the code. Advantages of Eulerian codes. Sharp discontinuities are very nicely recovered, okay, very nicely. With one fluid element, you recover uh, discontinuity. Um, hydrodynamical instabilities are much, are in general, nice followed uh, for several characteristic times. There are disadvantages. Again, it's not manifestly uh, Galilean invariant, uh, because if you add an advection term, a bulk velocity term, 
the Riemann solver doesn't know that you're adding a velocity, a bulk velocity, basically. Um, there is a preference for spatial directions. So if you have a Cartesian grid, there is, of course, a preference for x, y, and z. And you can overcome this problem by using unstructured meshes of moving meshes. Um, adaptive resolution is not trivial, believe me. And the degree of diffusivity, uh, here you want to have diffusivity that you don't have. Here you have diffusivity related to the Riemann solver, but it's something that is difficult to control, okay? It's something that you have to be very careful of, okay? So if you want to have you know, just one keyword here, the problem is that we, need, we include every time switches that are modifications of the, of the equations that we want to integrate, while well, here you have to control what you, what you do numerically. All right, then there is, of course, a huge uh, industry of comparison between the codes, because given the pros and cons, at this point, it's better that we make a decision on which code to use depending on the, on the problem that we need to solve, okay? This is from an old comparison paper by Oshie et al. in 2005, in which they ran a large cosmological box with a gas followed with a Lagrangian code, with an Eulerian code, and you know, you make a comparison by how you say, okay, it's nice, it's okay, uh, it's not that bad. But then if you look carefully and check, you can see that there are small scale features that are different in the, in the two codes. Uh, you have like the impression that in the Eulerian codes you have higher density here in this over dense region that is a galaxy cluster than here. There are small differences, okay, uh, that can be appreciated. Actually, if you want to, try, uh, to trace the origin of these differences, it's actually pretty, uh, the differences are not negligible. There are control tests that the people run to appreciate these differences. For instance, the first one is the so-called test of the cold blob. You have a blob, which is cold, moving in, in a medium, which is hotter, in pressure equilibrium, okay? And what happens to this cold blob is that you have, an up, uh, you have a supersonic flow in front of the blob with a shock front, with a bow shock here, okay? And then you have a subsonic flow between the shock and the blob. And what happens is that what you expect physically is that as this uh, blob is moving in a wind against a hot wind, this blob is progressively destroyed on the head by uh, Rayleigh Taylor instabilities. And then once you have stripped gas, you have mixing caused by uh, Calvin Helmholtz instabilities. This is what you expect. All right, people run simulations using a variety of SPH and grid codes. And what the people notice is that in the SPH codes, this blob is rather persistent against disruption uh, caused by the wind, okay? So you see that this blob here in SPH is flattened by this wind, okay, but it's never destroyed. In the Eulerian codes instead, this, this blob is initially flattened and then you have hydrodynamical instabilities developing and the, the completely destroying the blob after a few, um, few characteristic time scales. If you make a zoom in of the particle distribution at, on the head of the blob, what you notice is that the particle distribution in Lagrangian codes in SPH has this distribution. If, if you further zoom in, zoom in, you notice that this is, the, this is the blob and this is the hot wind, and you see that there is a sort of discretization here, okay? And this is exactly the effect of the surface tension caused by the spurious force arising from the lack of diffusivity in SPH. And the, it is this diffuse, oops, it is this diffuse, um, sorry, this surface tension that prevents the development of the instabilities at the head of the blob and therefore prevents the disruption of the blob itself. But then again, if you allow for artificial thermal diffusion, this is what happens. So this is the SPH with artificial thermal diffusion without, and you clearly see that after, as time goes by, in this case, you completely destroy the blob, much like you do in an Eulerian code, while in the standard SPH, you preserve the blob. So you preserve the identity of the blob, if not the form. All right, it's a movie that it doesn't, yeah, don't even try. Um, um, okay, how much time I'm left with? Like 20 minutes, okay, I can uh, still say something. Okay, so this is another historical, um, uh, plot, if you want, uh, coming from a paper, from a rather old paper by Frank et al. in uh, 1999, the so-called Santa Barbara Cluster Comparison Project. In this project, what the people did at that time was to uh, collect together a bunch of simulation codes from different people, Lagrange and Eulerian, and, uh, and simulate the formation 
in a fully cosmological environment of a galaxy, of a massive galaxy cluster in an Einstein Desinter universe at that time. Okay, and this is simply a density map of what the people got at that time, okay? One interesting feature of that comparison was that, okay, sorry, and this is instead for the same cluster, okay, simulated nowadays with a, at a much better resolution with a standard SPH and with a new SPH. I, I ask you to concentrate just on the temperature map. This is the temperature map, okay? So you see the feature, there is a merger here going on uh, with a shock front. This is a bow shock here and here. This is standard SPH, this is SPH with diffusion. And you clearly see that in the SPH of, with diffusion, you have a much less complex thermal structure of the intracluster medium, okay? So all these tricks that I'm describing you, actually they have precise observational consequences, okay? They have precise observational consequences. And one has to be extremely careful whenever we make comparison between simulations and observations because we, we, we must be sure of what are the features that are related to the physics that we want to describe and which are related to um, the numerical methods. So which features are spurious and which are genuine physical features, okay? So again, the Bose shock is very nicely recovered, but the thermal structure is completely different than here, okay? All right, so this is an old plot from the, Santa, the original Santa Barbara comparison project in which is a plot of the entropy versus the radius, so it's the entropy profile of this cluster. So people working in X-rays usually define the entropy as the ratio between the temperature and the number density of electrons, in this case the gas density to a two-third. This is, strictly speaking, it's not the entropy, it's the adiabat, but anyway, let's call it entropy. Um, so what the people recognized at that time is that in all the Eulerian codes, there is a creation of an entropy core here, okay, with, there is a flattening in the central region which is not observed in this Lagrangian code. And running nowadays, this is still the solution that we would have with the standard SPH. The green is the solution that we would have exactly for the same cluster with an Eulerian code. And the red is the solution of the SPH, but using standard, but using thermal diffusion. One thing that I want to make clear is that we didn't move any parameter, we didn't adjust any parameter to make the red going over the green, okay? The choice of the parameters were only dictated by removing the pressure blip in the shock tube test, okay? So we just wanted to adjust that, and then we say, okay, let's simulate a cosmological, a, a structure in a cosmological environment, okay? So, Pretty nice, I mean, at least in this case, we have a convergence in the answer between Eulerian and Lagrangian code. So, but why we have this difference? Why we have this difference? Well, you can understand from, oops, sorry, you can understand from the previous plot here. So suppose that you are in SPH, in standard SPH. We said that we want, in the standard SPH, we preserve the entropy at the particle level. Therefore, suppose that you have a merger coming with a low, virial temperature into, into the hot atmosphere of my cluster, this merger brings low entropy gas, since it has low entropy, it has low virial temperature, right? So what the code does is to make sinking of low entropy gas at the center, okay? If you have low entropy gas entering into the cluster and you have no mixing of entropy, what happens is that the low entropy gas slowly uh, sinks to the center of my halo, right? And therefore I keep the entropy level at the center low. If I have mixing, this doesn't happen anymore, okay? If I have mixing, what happens is that, so this is the entropy for instance, I destroy my merging blobs, I diffuse the gas, okay? I thermalize the stripped gas from my merging blobs and I destroy this low level of entropy at the center. I don't have any more any sinking or low entropy gas because my ent low entropy gas is completely thermalized, it's completely diffused by thermal diffusion in the hot atmosphere of the main object, okay? All right. So, application to formation of cosmic structures. Um, again, this is a movie that doesn't go. This is another movie that doesn't go, okay. At least I want to show you. Okay, no, it doesn't show even the movie. 
So what does a cosmological simulation? A cosmological simulation basically does something quite simple. You take initial conditions from the cosmic microwave background and you evolve cosmic structures, okay? By solving your end body simulations and solving your hydrodynamics. One thing that need to be clear, as I said at the beginning, is that these cosmological simulations cover a huge dynamic range. We want to describe the hundreds of megaparsec relevant for cosmology to the parsec scale where we have star formation, supernova explosion, chemical enrichment, black hole accretion, and so on and so forth. So we are talking about you know, something like eight or more uh, decades in dynamic range, something that is not affordable with a, at least today. And that on the top of that, you want to describe a variety of complex astrophysical processes, like star formation again or supernova explosion. There is no possibility that we can describe them explicitly in a simulation. All right. So first problem, how do we generate initial conditions in simulations for cosmological simulations? So the problem in this case is to generate a distribution of particles with positions and velocities representing a realization of a Gaussian random field, assuming that we want to start from Gaussian initial conditions. Okay, a Gaussian random field with a given power spectrum that is completely specified by, I don't know, CMP fast class, whatever. You pick up your model, you generate your power spectrum at the redshift that you want, and you decide to generate the initial conditions. How do we generate initial conditions? Well, if we have a Gaussian random field, then what we know is that the Fourier transform of my density fluctuation field delta k, okay, should have a distribution such that the distribution of the moduli is a Rayleigh distribution and the distribution of phases is random, okay, because by the central limit theorem you want to produce a Gaussian random field. So you have delta k, which is given by the modulus of delta k times e to the i theta k to the phase. And this is the distribution of moduli and phases of my of the Fourier transform of my Gaussian random field. Then what you do simply is, I want to make a sampling of this distribution. So what I do is to generate a Gaussian delta k on a grid in Fourier space. So what I generate is a delta k, okay? For each value of k, I generate on a grid in Fourier space, I generate a delta k by throwing two random numbers, r1 and r2, taking minus two, P of k logarithm of this, and this en ensures me that I'm generating, that I'm making a sampling out of a Rayleigh distribution. And then this second condition here ensures me that the phases of this del complex number delta k are random between 0 and 2 pi. Okay? So I just generate a, a two random sequence of numbers, and I, uh, from a, and using an analytic expression for my P of k or tabulated expression for my P of k, I generate. Uh, the value of delta k on the grid. Then what to do? I do simply a Fourier transform. So I go back to uh, I go back to configuration space and I compute the potential on this grid on a grid in linear sorry in configuration space at the Lagrangian position Qs. Okay. So basically this is like the solution the Poisson equation um, on the on the on the configure in the configuration space. At this point, what I do is simply to use the trick of using the Zeldovich approximation to shift my particles. So basically what I do in the step three is to compute the linear theory velocity field on the grid by simply taking the, the, the gradient of the potential that I just computed, okay, multiplied by the linear growth factor of perturbations, and I compute the velocity at the Lagrangian coordinates on the grid. And then what I do, I move these particles according to Zeldovich approximation, okay? So basically, this gives me the possibility of generating positions of particles that are a representation of a realization of my uh, power spectrum for Gaussian initial conditions. Um, yes? No, they, in principle, they can apply to both dark matter and gas. Actually, you have a complication if you have dark matter particles with no negligible thermal velocity. So suppose that you have neutrinos, then the story is different because this, is, this helps you to give the velocity induced by gravity, by the gravitational instability. On the top of that, you have to include the thermal velocity, well, thermal or whatever velocity of the particle. For, for instance, in the case of neutrinos, you have to sample on the top of that, you have to sample the Fermi-Dirac distribution. Okay? Uh, all right. So um, then I have to make a decision on uh, which redshift to generate these initial conditions. 
And the golden rule, one of the golden rules, is that, for instance, you want to have this redshift large enough that D of Z is small enough here to have small displacements to make sure that you are very far from the shell crossing regime because you want to generate initial conditions in a regime where the Zeldovich approximation is correct, okay? Of course, also in this case, you, you can use a number of improvements, of refinements, like generate initial conditions on an unstructured glass, an anamorphous glass, rather than on a regular grid, or use a second order Lagrangian perturbation theory instead of the Zeldovich approximation. But the bottom line is that you use some Lagrangian perturbation theory to generate the initial conditions for your simulations. Um, this is the, exactly, this is the, uh, how the initial conditions look like. So in this particular case, this is a portion of the initial condition generated for an hydrodynamic simulations in which the white points are the dark matter particles and the red are the baryons, okay? You see that the baryons, oops, sorry, that the baryons are located half grid spacing in this case. And you look, if you try to defocus this image, you can recognize a sort of large scale pattern in this displacement, okay? And this large scale pattern is exactly the, you know, the, the effect of the power spectrum, that if, uh, the fact that you are generating a power spectrum. It's not a uniform distribution. It's not a random distribution. It's not even, uh, a, it's not even um, a distribution on a regular grid. It's something for which you have a pattern of large scale features, which is given by the power spectrum, the lar long wavelength modes of the power spectrum. And believe it or not, if you compute then the power spectrum, okay, from these initial conditions, in the bottom, the black curve is the power spectrum, linear power spectrum that you get from CMB fast or whatever, okay? And on the top, the points are the computation of the power spectrum from the particle distribution that I sh just showed you before, this one. And as you can see, you actually do a good job in generating, uh, in generating a particle distribution whose power spectrum is exactly the same modulus some difference is exactly the same as the power spectrum that you use to generate the Zeldovich displacements. If, you're, if you look carefully, you clearly see that in fact, if you go to small case, you don't have a perfect overlap between the points and the power spectrum, and the theoretical power spectrum. And this is sampling variance, because as you go to small case, you have only few Fourier modes that you can accommodate in your computational volume, and therefore you sample your live distribution just with few Fourier modes. And the consequence is that you are not accurate in sampling that, and therefore you have small mistakes. As you go to higher and higher case, you accommodate more and more Fourier modes, and therefore, you know, you have a better representation of your power spectrum. And therefore, large case, you have a much nicer um, representation of the power spectrum. So this is cosmic variance, okay, basically. And the difference between this and this is the evolution. After some time, uh, the black curve is the linear evolution, the points is the evolution by the end body, and you get what you hope to get. So on large scales, linear evolution is preserved. On small scales, you have no linearities developing, and therefore you have deviations from the linear power spectrum that takes place on smaller and smaller scales as evolution goes by. So it works. Um, I think I have almost done. Um, I will skip all the rest of my talk, which is not small amount of slides. Just to make sure, I just want to show you one thing before I move to the conclusions. Uh, this is just an example uh, of all the complex astrophysical processes happening, taking place on small scales. So suppose that you want to describe star formation in these simulations. What is star formation? Star formation is basically gas cooling down by radiative losses, by radiative cooling. Eventually, due to the lack of pressure, this gas becomes denser and denser, okay? And eventually it becomes so dense and so cold that it starts forming stars. Again, star formation is a process taking place on scales that we have no hope to represent, okay? So basically what the people do is to say, okay, we have dark matter, we have multi-population of particles, we have dark matter population, gas population, star population. Stars are collisionless and therefore they feel gravity, only gravity, much like dark matter particles. Gas undergoes a number of, you know, astrophysical phenomena like radiative cooling, uh, star formation once some density and temperature criterion are met. 
Gas undergoes gravity, of course, so it's coupled to dark matter and stars, but it also undergoes hydrodynamics. So you have to describe this system. Of course, what happens is that stars explode into supernovae, and the supernovae hits back the gas in a feedback process. Of course, you, have some, you can have some uh, UV background, like the one that Andrea Ferrara described this morning, that you have to include in your simulations if you want to have a realistic description of the cosmological evolution of your variants, which also affect the gas, and so on and so forth. So at this point, I just skip everything because I want to, I just don't want to bother you. As you can see, I have many, many more slides, uh, many more. Okay. <laughs> this was actually meant for two lectures, but yeah, which I don't have time. So let me give just one Final message. So what you need to bring home, in my view. Um, first of all, is that numerical and body and hydro simulations represent, in my personal view, the ideal framework to capture the complexity of cosmic structure formation. Okay? Cosmic structure formation is a complex process. And this is, in my view, the best way that we have today uh, to, to describe in detail what happens to galaxy formation. But there are a number of but. First one is that an exact numerical hydrodynamical method simply does not exist. There is no such a thing. An exact numerical hydrodynamical method is not something we have, okay? We have approximation to hydrodynamics, okay? And we have to be aware of this. Second, always test and compare different methods to understand the range of validity and limitations. In this game of simulations, never be tired to test, test and test because you never know which is whether you have a feature generated by physics or by numerical artifacts. Astrophysical processes, keep in mind, they are not self-consistently described. There are phenomenological recipes that we use to implement star formation and feedback. Whenever you hear somebody saying that we describe in a self-consistent way galaxy formation, this is plain wrong, okay? So what we can do, is to describe, include phenomenological description of physics. So for instance, star formation, we can use something reproducing the smith kennicott law for whoever of you are familiar with these things. Uh, you can impose to reproduce simple observations and then ask to your simulations whether you can reproduce more than that, okay? So this is what we can do. And it's not an easy, easy business. In these days, we have hard time to produce a realistic, realistic galaxies, especially these galaxies, okay? So always keep in mind that there is a range of astrophysical processes that are described as sub-resolution effective models, okay? So in, gal in galaxy classes that I didn't talk about as an example of the application simulations, these simulations can help to calibrate cosmological uh, applications of clusters, but again, the recommendation is to use with some grain of salt uh, for the reasons that I just told, just because we want to be sure where is the physical effect and where is the, um, and where is the numerical effect. So just one final uh, sort of provocative question. Um, shall we include, should we really aim to include in simulations all the, all the physical processes we can think of, okay? Uh, is really this is the business? Or said in other words, uh, like some of my colleagues say, shall we include so many astrophysical processes to the point that we, can, we are in the position of defining a best fitting model uh, for simulations? Well, my, my personal opinion is that if we have a simulation that includes all the astrophysics, then it would be as difficult to interpret as the real data. So I don't know what, how much are we gaining, except that we are including, along with astrophysical processes, a lot of numerical artifacts, okay? So I think we have to be careful, and especially refrain from thinking about numerical simulations as producing the best fitting model, okay? In these numerical simulations, you have a number of parameters we saw the parameters related to the hydrodynamics, but there is an even larger set of parameters related to astrophysics. Star formation rate, feedback efficiency, how much energy you put in kinetic feedback, how much you put in thermal feedback, how fast a black hole is allowed to accrete, which is the, how do you distribute the mechanical energy um, released by the black hole in AGN feedback. There is a huge number of parameters, okay? There is no hope that we can do something like a best fitting of these parameters against observations, okay? This is not what we want to do. We want to understand whether we are getting 
the global picture of galaxy formation. Um, I don't think we have, to, we have to best fit to data when we use a, a simulation. There is not a single Lagrangian that we simulate. There is no such a thing like a direct numerical simulation, direct numerical solution um, that we have for galaxy formation that we can use as a benchmark for interpreting observations. Okay, so try to be conservative. Maybe I'm too much conservative, but okay, thank you.